Hey everybody, this is your host Jeremy. I want to take a quick second at the beginning of the episode here just to let you know that we have launched a Patreon to support the show. Check us out at patreon.com slash giving the mic. Your contribution helps us cover hosting costs, edit costs, and even some equipment upgrades. Patreon is a way that you can automatically support the show each month with a donation as little as a dollar. Five dollars every month gives you access to regular premium episodes as well as the backer only special cat photo email list. You can actually see the cats of the host that you can hear in the background. Once again, that is at patreon.com slash giving the mic. I thank you, or my co-hosts thank you, and the cats thank you. Before we start. I would just like to say that uh, after my previous appearance on the podcast, there's a few things I need to clear up. The first is the author I was thinking of last episode was actually uh, Edward Joseph Epstein, and I regret the error. Who wrote the CIA book? Yeah. Uh, it's called Deception. Yeah. And also, I said that Trump wasn't a Nazi. I recorded that before Charlottesville. Now we can effectively say he is. Well, I'm not going to say that because I'm planning on running for office as a Republican. Mm -hmm. Oh, I see. And I don't want to get in trouble. You don't want to, you, yeah, you don't want to lose your voter base. I will say that I was deeply troubled <laughs> by the response that he gave. And also, I do not think that women turn into cats and suck the breath out of babies once a month. I, I don't know if that made it into the final cut, but. I think, I thought. How do you know our darkest secrets? Yeah, no, okay. So it's true. Okay, yeah. No, but I just wanted to clear that stuff up before we get started. Blame so, it all on the I like to clear up the fact that I don't hate old people. I just hate or, or people that have senility. Uh, but I hate <laughs> former presidents that do, that everybody worships. And Yeah. We regret the error. Um, I don't remember what I said, but I regret it all. <laughs> you spent a lot of time talking about taco apps, as I recall. Oh, the, oh Taco Bro. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Trademark. So this is a special retrospective episode. You'll have to Kevin return to the previous episodes. I'm Troy McClure. I'm returning guest Jacob Mercy. So I guess this time you guys gave the mic to the right person. Has anyone done that joke yet? No. That's Nailed it. Nailed it. Yep. Nailed it. Yep. Stuck the landing. Nice. All right. I'm, I'm going to go now. Hi, I'm Jeremy. I'm a dork living in Portland, Oregon, who spent too many years listening to podcasts and not doing anything creative. This is my attempt to rectify that, to create and contribute something where I talk to people about their cultural obsessions and try to give some recommendations of my own. Welcome to Giving the Mic to the Wrong Person. Did you want to Did you want to jump in here at some point? <laughs> and you're listening to yet another edition of Giving the Mic to the Wrong Person. I'm your host, Jeremy, uh, joined once again by three folks who deigned to sacrifice their Sunday morning by coming down to our Snake Apartment Studios and recording this bullshit with me. Um, volunteer guests who are on, here of, of their own free volition and free will and not compelled at all. Can you please, uh, like I said, let's do a, you know, introduce yourself if you would. I am Natasha, resident soul-sucking cat. I'm Garrett Burton. This is Garrett in the mornings. I'm Jacob Mercy, and I would also like to take back what I said earlier about Hanzo Mains. I think that was in poor taste, and I don't think they should all be killed. Uh, <laughs> I do think we should get rid of that character, though. That is ridiculous. You can't, you can't play that character. He's especially overpowered, right? Well, no, it's just nobody can actually shoot. So. Oh yeah, he's a guy that the archery. Yeah. yeah. But you don't. What the? Um, wait, how cyborgy is Hanzo? I can't remember if he has any, any. If he's got any enhancements, or if he's just the guy with the super powerful bow. He's got a robot arm, I think. Okay, so how many? Wait, how many Overwatch characters do not have either full augmentation or partial augmentation? I don't know. I just started playing, so okay. I haven't kept track. I know that the gorilla has augmentation or right. a kick-ass suit. I would assume he's got a jetpack. Bam. And glasses. I mean, glasses are kind of an augmentation if you think about it. Well, without it a is. doubt, they're an augmentation. Yeah, I mean, glasses were really the start of, you know, the the, the cyberpunk universe. Mm -hmm. Maybe canes. Canes like might that. have come before glasses. But, Especially sword uh, canes. Yeah. Oh, sword canes. What was the topic? <laughs> sword canes. Uh, the dead uh, dead British economists, William Jeff... Jeff wait, what the hell is his name? William uh, Jefferson Clinton? No, not William Jefferson Clinton. William Jefferson Keynes, who uh, was the strange... John Maynard Keynes is his name. Right, yeah. Maynard Keenan Keynes, the, <laughs> British, the, the British economist who not only, you know, helped set up 
uh, New Deal era policies, but also fronted two real sweet uh, rock bands in the pre-war era. Mm-hmm. I'm highly qualified to discuss this because I listened to a Epic Rap Battles YouTube video about him, so I'm good to go. <laughs> and uh, Lynn Manuel Miranda is writing a hip hop opera about John Maynard Keynes right now. Oh, really? Yeah, nope. it's... I made that up. Oh, well, I would have believed you. I, I would have believed it too. Are, are they going to call it Liquid Sword Keynes? <laughs> that would be pretty great. Uh, they get the jizz on board for that. Yeah, hell yeah. Anybody else want to get on this action? No. <laughs> okay. We could make more Keynes jokes. Yeah. And our topic, so as as far as we actually have one, uh, Garrett, you brought one today. Let us, uh, we'll turn it over to you to introduce it, and then we will discuss and digress off of it as per our usual. All right. Well, I didn't remember this going to a vote, but I wanted to talk about sort of tacking on to the last episode uh, with Lillian. We talked a lot about uh, the role that information plays uh, in how we structure our lives now, and the game of the notion of gamification and we're doing all these you know we're keeping stats on our lives basically and we don't necessarily know why and i was reading uh, a book i i recommend it on the show it's called racecraft by barbara and karen fields and there is if you'll indulge me like two fucking paragraphs i'll get through this she's she's trying to write a memoir of her grandmother uh who had an interesting life and she's trying to decide whether she's going to tell the story sort of narratively or try to tell it as she's trained as, which is a sociologist and a historian. And this is where she starts having some, where she starts wrestling with it. She says, but then not long ago, I happened to read an essay that made me think further about the respectable territory of verifiable fact, the storyteller by Walter Benjamin. In it, he observes that the main form communication takes in the modern world is that is that of information, a form which in his words, lays claims to prompt verify verifiability. He goes on to characterize this development not as an advance, but as an impoverishment. Storytelling dies, he says, as this new form of communication arises. Storytelling successor information represents an impoverishment because and because and to the degree that the producer of information accomplishes precisely what we scholars strive to do, namely to induce some body of material to deliver a explanation of its own accord without adding anything to it. But the finest stories, according to Benjamin, are characterized by the lack of explanation because the hearer, the hearer reader is left to interpret according to his own understanding. The narrative achieves an amplitude that lacks information or that information lacks. Does That's that really great. Does that track with people? So he's, she's basically arguing for the, for the, the uh, benefits of narrative storytelling to. Well, I think what she's, I think what she's saying that Benjamin is saying is that there's something about telling stories that gets at a truth that, Absolutely. Oh, he was. Why am I doing this? We're not recording. We're not. We're not going live to tape. Walter Benjamin. Walter Benjamin. Dude was German. Remember? Okay. Oh, uh, um, so I use an Americanized pronunciation of Either his way. name. He's one of the Frankfurt School guys, from right. what I understand. And, and, uh, and you're out. Yeah. You're off the podcast. Shit. Go. Committed suicide before the war, I believe. Um, but or in the earlier. I, I, th- I think. I think what he's trying to say, and I think that I think actually when you guys were talking about Watchmen a moment ago, you were kind of getting at that, like. Uh, this notion of that storytelling without, you know, without this reliance on facts actually gets at truth in a different way and perhaps a more substantial way. Absolutely. Um, and the more that we structure lives around the best information and, and, you know, technocratic solutions to problems, that sort of thing, like we actually miss something about what makes a meaningful life, what makes for a good society, those sorts of questions. Like those, like liberals don't ask that question. What, what, what makes a good society? It's, it's how do we run this efficiently? You know what I mean? Yeah. Pragmatism. So I didn't remember this coming up for a vote to be the topic. No, I love this topic. It's it's right on my wheelhouse. I feel like a lot of the way that we communicate and in terms of like, if you're asking people to just take in facts, I mean, Verit is a great example, right? We've got facts. Yeah, I feel it's very pertinent because it's but, shit like Verit. But what is what is what are those facts? You know, they are essentially uh, opinions. It's you know, in some ways, because they do come from this liberal viewpoint, and it needs to be stated that like people don't like think that way. That's why we consume so much media. We 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 find humanity in stories. 
and in and in, in, in our association with not just you know characters but actual people and knowing their intention and their ideology and all those things real quick um just because i don't know if i'm going to be including it in the episode can we can we uh, do a quick rehash of what our watchmen uh over our what our watchmen um discussion was which i believe it was a point that you brought up jacob yes my argument was that Watchmen is actually... The film, yeah. Yeah, Watchmen the film is actually a poor adaptation because it is faithful in the wrong ways. While it takes panels directly from the comic, it unfortunately adds things like glossy special effects and slow motion and shiny costumes and makes everything very fancy when Watchmen the comic was ultimately a deconstruction. Um, and so you're taking the same information, but you're portraying it in a different way. Right, I think Watchmen was much more. The comic was aimed at much more of a, well, the, the documentarian versus hyperstylization. Right, it's about the mundane. It's about having to pay rent. It's about yeah. dealing with somebody who's never going to get old and is always going to be better than you. Right, and it's about the insecurities and limitations. It's about superheroes in the real world and how that would drag them down ordinary people yeah. struggling to kind of live up to this because uh, you know dr manhattan sets the precedent and everybody else has to kind of follow suit and uh, you know and obviously you know things are very complicated lives are very complicated and i like that but yeah the, the movie lost that so, a lot right even though it's a shot by shot recreation in a right. lot of cases just by presenting the information in a different way the message of the comic is ultimately subverted exactly w what message do you think the film tells i haven't seen the film so i'm not sure there is a strong message frankly i, I, I think, think that's that, that, part of the problem that, it's about these gods and these epic struggles and mm -hmm. that the director thought that uh malin ackerman was like really hot and that was about it <laughs> well i mean well, she not wrong but yeah because i i've been thinking about this notion that because we talk about facts a lot you know and and very it's a, a great example but yeah and, yeah. and also um Timestamp Verit as of our recording, <laughs> Verit is an actual thing. V e r r i t. When this when this pod actually gets released, God only knows how long it's going to take me to put it out. Who knows what the fuck tomorrow will bring? Right. This will probably this will be some subject on on like the the trash heap of months past. But uh, so let's just say that um, we'll use that as uh, as our two little f pod pod footnotes of both wa our discussion of Watchmen, which may or may not have happened off mic. And or Verit, but back to or sorry to to completely diverge, but back to um, your point, Garrett. Your point. I don't know why about. you're acting like Verit isn't going to be around forever, but all right, uh, because no. well, I was say all because all, all griffs have an <laughs> all griffs are have inevitably have an in, well, the vast majority of griffs 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 Professor Gr Griff. Uh, well, not well. Pro, yeah, Professor. Well, hell, even Professor. I didn't mean, I didn't mean to take you off course. Even Professor. Even Professor Griff was only. He was only. In, he was only in the golden era of Public Enemy for a few albums before he kind of like. That's said an a, excellent point. Said a few things a bit. Um, uh, 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 things that even they found inexcusable. Although I don't. I cannot remember if he actually ever reunited with the band later on. Also, the, um, but in terms of like reunited, Grifter is ne was originally an image character, and is now because Jim Lee joined. Uh, is, is he like chief creative? No, he's not. No, Jeff Johns is chief creative. Jim Lee is like what publisher? Yeah, he, he got he's, uh, he took over. He got a high, he got elevated to a high thing in DC. So now all of his characters, including Grifter, the '90s aggro. Um, Proto Antifa, uh, bounty hunter with his full on face. Well, in terms of having he was full on like he had instead of just having the kerchief over his face, he had the full on like rag over his face, only with like spawn white eye eye holes it cut was out. The 90s. Yeah, you he's know. now a DC character and reunited with them. Um, but like all grifts, yeah, <laughs> like all grifts, such uh, at some point they're. The vast majority of you know you can't if you can't fool all the people all the time. Eventually, um, grifts will end because the grifter at least you know probably dies. All right, I, I, I'm really outraged that you're calling Verit a grift. I mean, one thing that I don't think you can accuse Peter Dow of it's insincerity. I mean, like did, good, was was point. Ed Gein running a, a, a grift when he was <laughs> making a suit out of making body parts? I mean, no, that, no, that Ed Gein, no, that was a graft. He was, was a Gein or Gein? 
I'm just going to ask. I, I if, say if, Gein, if, but if I don't know. If it doesn't exist anymore, how is my mom going to look up the... How am I going to give her the identification code for a fact? So, what am I going to do with I, all these Verit Ferret plushies? Oh, my God. Did you... S- well, you're just going to have to rebrand them somehow. <laughs> but, all Verits uh, are furry now. But yeah, so, or, the, or the Verit fursuits. So, I really have something to tie to what Jacob said uh, 45 minutes ago, mm-hmm. which was that... that one of us does. That the Watchmen... The the thing he's saying about Watchmen is you're taking the same you're taking the same sort of instances or facts like the, it, the datum the, and, the the little instance of data and, and it, yes and what matters is how you tie them together and uh, we all have ways of tying I mean I even think hard science is basically storytelling in the sense that you're taking facts and trying to tell the most plausible story for how the universe works it is and I think that things like Verit show a sort of and that you need. You need to believe in something to tell that story. And things like Verit showcase that they don't believe in anything. You know what I mean? They just Absolutely. believe that somehow fact's good. You know, mm-hmm. like, I, I, I don't understand it. If you, if, if I may quote the classic film Sucker Punch, <laughs> if you don't stand for something, you'll fall for anything. Goddamn right. A very special Zack Snyder episode. <laughs> um, so anyway... This is a this is a big issue in literature and literary theory. I believe it was James Woods wrote about the rise of what uh, is essentially the fact or information novel. So you had things like White Teeth by Zadie Smith mm-hmm. and a lot of other similar books that are very obsessed with trivia and details and minutia. And Chuck Palahniuk kind of went through a phase where he was telling you all these fun little details. And yeah. it worked fairly well in some of his books books where it's sort of all tied into a larger theme but then he kind of lost his touch Mm -hmm. and it just sort of became here's some trivia also here's a story his more interesting stuff was his uh stranger than fiction which is he was again narrative storytelling around like small interesting stories that you right and i think a lot of modern literature is an attempt to react to the information age in as much as it's throwing a lot of information and details at us in an attempt to try to work through how to process this. And you also have things like the Christopher Nolan films, which are very concerned with information, confusion, misunderstanding, and and trivia. There's a lot of very small details that are very important. And not knowing something can mean the difference between life and death. Mm -hmm. And I think... Understanding things and understanding how to contextualize things are very much preoccupations of the modern era. Absolutely. Of like assemb- assembling the little bits of data into uh, into an an, under- an understandable architecture. You're turning bits of data into actual information. Yeah, I read something. I wish I remember where I read it, but it was it was something from the Demon Haunted World by Carl Sagan. Oh, I love that. Book. Uh, about this notion about like what happens when there's so much information out, but I fucking can't remember what it, it was. An interesting point too. God damn it! Someone find it now. I will. Just kidding. Let's see if I can look it up on my phone. No. I can always but, draw, but, but we can drop what, it. What did, yeah. did Woods conclude anything about? Did he have a, a perspective on on whether that was a good or a bad thing, or whether it's just something that's being fleshed out? Well, he's old and grouchy, so I don't think he liked it. Okay, <laughs> but you you wait. You refer you do you said James Woods yeah. as in the James Woods? Okay, to be clear, there are two of them. <laughs> this only, is the this is the same two. problem with the idiot uh, critic Alex Ross, who writes for the New Yorker and <laughs> does a terrible <laughs> job, yeah. and the comic book artist Alex Ross. They are not the same. Actually, somebody was explaining to me at Comic Con. Oh no, one of my friends actually met Alex Ross and brought his daughter to like meet him, and he was like, "Are you going to buy something?" Yeah. <laughs> That's that. That's a reasonable question. Speaking to somebody who works at cons, are you? Are you? Well, you know, when he when yeah, I, I lacked context of my story, but basically he was just wanted to introduce her and have her, uh, you know, childhood hero like look up from his table. Are you gonna buy something? You gotta buy something. Well, I, that was fun, you guys. Sorry, <laughs> that was like my diversions, and they're not fun. I, I, I will say, I do want to say though that. Rob Thomas, the lead singer of Matchbox 20, and Rob Thomas, the guy who created Veronica Mars and iZombie, are the same person. I just want to be very clear about that. Far out. That's really cool. Yeah, that's a little bit of trivia for you. A little little info fact for this very special episode. Keep it real or forget about it. We're going to be dropping trivia the whole time. Yeah. We're basically, like, metatextualizing. Mm-hmm. I want to know how we're tying that back to Zack Snyder. Painfully. I, d- I do regret... Um, when the one time I did encounter Adam Hughes at, uh, 
It was no, it, had, it was Rose City because I think it was like the it was one of the years after the Stumptown Comics Fest had folded into Rose City, and Adam Hughes was there, and it was like why I didn't actually have them go up there and either sign my little thing or, but you know, you know, pay him for to make a sketch of Zatanna, um, nice. is beyond me. But or maybe Black Canary, but. Really? Well, I think the information thing cuts both ways because right. on the one hand you're being drowned in information, but on the other hand you have things like scholarly journals, which are incredibly expensive to publish in and get access to, and more generally you have things like pop culture where we're essentially hostage to things like Disney mm -hmm. and these massive corporations who hold on to these copyrights for decades longer than they should, mm -hmm. and I think that has a really negative effect on the culture because a big part of creativity is not being creative. It's about taking things and remixing them and sticking them together and borrowing and stealing. Exactly. And copyright is really crippling that in a lot of ways. Right. Right. Yeah. Well, and that's part of the problem with, especially with, with any creative field in an ownership based society, you're just always going to have those problems. You get, I mean, you, you also have that gatekeeper problem about who gets to tell the stories. And now we call it, I mean, to some degree, there is real cultural appropriation, but like some of it gets really overblown. And it's because we're not talking about the issue of ownership, propriety. You know what I mean? Like, like ideally, anyone can, should be able to tell any story that they want. And if, if they find an audience for it, great. If they don't, still fine. You Absolutely. know what I mean? Uh, um, I don't, fuck, I, I don't know how well that tied into what you just said, but. But I was springboarding off of no, it somehow. No, I think that's. I think that's good. I was going to add that you know I've worked in intellectual property, and copyright law you know has has changed so much. Basically, the ownership of ideas and the ownership of 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 something that is not you know even um, you know just this idea that you have to have a lot of money to do so, you have to have a lot of power to do so. And that the government basically, you know, assists this with the the way that they basically take patents and stuff like that um, from, they, you know, depending on who it's from and which law firm is doing it, you know, then there's a certain kind of level of engagement there. Mm -hmm. So it's it's kind of it's very insidious, I think, well, this idea that we are limited to these people in power and we cannot. Yeah. I, and I think Marx was right about this. I think what you know, Marx said that, like, eventually capitalism is going to get so productive. There's not going to be like shit to make anymore. Everyone will yeah. have all the shit they need. And and uh, and the rare, like trendy product will pop up here and there. But zero. But yes. And Juicero's rest in peace. Juicero is a great example because they had to find a way to charge you rent to make juice. And that's what intellectual property is. It's like, how do we charge people rent? Because we can't make things anymore. Uh, so we need we need to own. I mean, I mean, I'm just saying, like, 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 if if we had the patent law that we had now, Leibniz and and Newton would be fighting over who had the patent for calculus. Oh, you yeah, know what I mean? Be. Like Leibniz. Yes, I think it's I think it's pronounced Walter. <laughs> no, it's pronounced Sinkovich. A lot of people get that wrong. <laughs> Jesus Christ. How many people in the room do you think know that one? I have no idea what that meant. God damn I'm just, it. I'm just sitting over here nodding God damn and it. smiling. I'm here, I'm gonna I'm gonna pull up his name. You've seen his name before. God damn it. Oh as for, Bill? Yeah. I love him. As for, well nobody knows how to pronounce his name. I've I, always heard it Saint Cabbage. It, I was doing a bit. Yeah. Uh as far as the whole Hollywood thing goes, what a lot of people don't know is that you know, you were talking about Marx, the famous silent film actor, mm -hmm. and a lot of people don't know that a big part of the origins of Hollywood was actually patent and copyright violation. I mean, you know, they got caught with Nosferatu, but they basically just changed the name and kept going. Uh -huh. But if you, you know, Edison owned a ton of patents on on the technology that was developing, and so what they did is they just moved to California yeah, farthest, because it was harder to enforce. Far, it was literally farthest away, and so you know, fuck you, we're going to the other coast. Yeah, so the big boom that we saw in that particular developing media was basically people breaking the law and mm -hmm. c taking advantage of this innovation in order to present information in, in, with new technology. So, like, that makes me think, and, and I'm not making a value judgment here, mm -hmm. uh, but that makes me think of, like, Uber, how they're behaving. They're just saying, like, f like you know, fuck the, the municipal laws of these cities that we're going into. Oh, yeah, and, and what is that 
food delivery system, but they're not calling it a delivery system because then they'd have to be subject to local law. Is that right? I, Uber yeah. Eats. Yeah. It's like while you are while you are ferrying people back and forth here, you know, you pick up a, a couple of whoppers get, for you know, them. Yeah, take get yeah. their bring their takeout to them because we're gonna, we want to they want to fight Postmates or Grubhub or God knows whatever. Well, I think. There's a there's a massive war going on with information. I mean, this recent disaster with it's Equifax, right? Right. Yeah. yeah. Actually, I think it's Equifax, but <laughs> Walter. Yeah. The one of the things that's happening there is that, and this is something I've been paranoid about for a long time, and it, which is the idea that we're getting chopped up and processed in right. terms of our own data, and Uber actually definitely capitalizes on that i remember mm-hmm. they're getting in trouble because their app is basically recording you even if you're not getting a ride from them and i just signed up for a new thing called movie pass oh yeah where it's 10 bucks a month and you can watch one movie a day for free oh, and wow. as many as you want and the way that they're apparently making money off of this is they are basically sucking as much data out of you as they can every time you go see a movie you're yeah. the product yeah there was um there was, I read an article about Nest, you know, the home thermostat control system that they said, look, you're selling, they're selling a product, but once everyone who wants a Nest has one, how are they going to make money? And well, the way they're going to make money is some asshole's going to figure out that because you like your heat at this level at this time of day, they're, they're going to find something meaningful in that and find a way to sell something to you or, or, or use it to, you know, manipulate you your through marketing. Advertise to you. Right. Um, so that's going to be their next revenue stream. And it, and I don't think it's naive. I think that was probably built into the, the business model from the it beginning. It always is, you know? yeah. The, uh, there's, yeah. The, yeah, there's there's a bit, I believe, either in, it's either, it's a, in, in a cut scene, either in the opening, in the opening scene or one of the, like, mid-game scenes in, I believe, in, like, Watch Dogs 2, where the narrator actually talks about how, and, like, one of their little, because, like, in the game, you are member if not leader of a little like you know um san fran <laughs> effectively you are you are you're you're a 90s san fran ad busters culture jammers hell yeah in uh in post in uh in you know post gentrification san francisco um but you're black right uh yes okay and the only other the only other black member of your team comes to a, a bad end well, and probably oh. the only other black person in San Francisco. <laughs> yeah, sort of. Although the, uh, the I don't know. Uh, uh, I guess the villain is sort of white, but he's also Slavic, so I don't know how. Um... Slavs are always villains, guys. Mm-hmm. But um, but the, no, but one of the one of the bits I bring it up because one of the bits in the thing is the voiceover does say something about you are now uh, you are now worth less than the data you create. Big Brother no longer works alone. Thousands of little brothers monitor and aggregate your every move, building a complete digital profile of you to be bought, sold, or stolen in an instant. You may think that you are immune or underestimate the risk, but your digital shadow is already compromised. Insurance companies use algorithms to monitor your life habits and limit or deny coverage. Health providers determine if your cancer is worth treating. Search results and news fees are skewed to bias mood and influence your vote, engineering social uprisings on a massive scale. You are now less valuable than the data you produce. produce. This is the new reality. Going dark is no longer an option. And it's a game that came out, I I believe, you know, written, you know, written and came out in like 2015, 2016, released latter half of 2016 i think and it's one of those things where and i think even jeff gersman talked about how it's a game where it is so ripped from the headlines that especially after the election playing it got a lot less comfortable um because a, a lot of a lot of the game is like you're kind of like this little like cyberpunk um social media culture jammers with like youtube streams and shit and but a lot of but you're you are in the kind of like you know the um you're in the Google bus. In fact, at one point, there's a plot line where your character has to, you know you you actually steal a uh, an in world. Uh, there's an in world version of Google. You're going to say N word. <laughs> no, it's no, it's not. Ma- it back. No, it's not. Ma- it's not Mafia Three. Not Mafia Three is uh, that's that's where that comes into play. Um, they steal a Google bus. Is that what you're saying? Right in 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 Watch Dogs Two. Mm. An actual Google bus. It's like does it say Google on the side? No, it's do, a, they do they do they censor it like in Arrested Development season four? What? That one? No, that, that God, I don't even remember that. I'm thinking, I think I had I I only saw like a, the first 
the first quarter of that season. No, but in game, you're, you're the in game version of Google. I think it's called like Noodle. N U oh. Umalat D L E or some bullshit. N- yeah, Metal. but that's but at one point, but they they are you're driving around. You know, they're really you, as you're driving on this this very, you know, this um, this limited verisimilitude version of San Francisco and the East Bay and around. But yeah, you you know you will look over and yeah, there are these Google buses passing around. Why did I talk? Why did I bring up the, the Google buses? Oh, because that's just the, that's the setting that you're in. You're, you're in this like, kind of like culture jammy. Mm-hmm. Culture jammy uh, group of characters in there, but ex- the, part of the um, call it like you know, one of the more um, one of the more bits of the of the of the game is the you know that every you know everything you do is being tracked at all times, mm-hmm. um, yeah. tracked and sold. God only knows what Fitbit is doing with uh, the the stats that they're that they're generating off of you know Fitbit and the Apple and the Apple Health app are being um, you know if. If anything is eventually going to be sold off so, of that, but so like personally, like I'm really, uh, I'm I'm really cynical about this this that thing that you're just talking about. But there's a lot of people that are like incredibly enthusiastic about it. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, I'm talking about like the the Neil deGrasse Tyson like like devotees on online. They seem to be really excited about yeah. The science will save us. Look at all the data yeah. that they're... Neil deGrasse uh, Tyson is like. Did you know that no matter what you look up, there's now porn of it? It's true. <laughs> Neil well, he's very Tyson funny. There's a universe of exciting new erotic possibilities <laughs> and ge- and and gender swapped erotic possibilities, no less. Um, and so, am I just too dour about this, or or is there? No, that's the dystopia that we live in, right? Well, I mean, I, I mean, is it or isn't it? You know to, what I mean? That's what I, want. I. I believe that tools are inherently neutral. It's a question yeah. of how they're applied, and it's a it's a question of how they are handled in a culture. So, as somebody who writes, I'm D- constantly delighted by the ability to look up things that I right. wouldn't be able to look up. I can, you know, I was interested in er- the Arecibo telescope and I was able to use a VR headset to have a virtual visit and be able to look around and see the environments and make my story that much more authentic. Yeah, that, that is, is tremendously exciting. That is yeah, really cool. Huge. And like all the things I think about that I wouldn't know, you know, like Jeremy posted something the other day about someone who thinks he's just uh, figured out what the Voynich manuscript yeah. is about. Oh, really? Mm-hmm. And Finally. I was like, one, if, I, if there wasn't an internet, I wouldn't know what the fucking Voynich manuscript is. And two, I wouldn't have had that really cool, interesting news. Um, so there's these niches of 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 what you like. You can get into whatever you're into. And, and, and uh, you know, I'm not I'm not saying anything interesting or new about that, but. But I am I am excited about it. But it's this other aspect of it of like who uses and controls information and and it, you know is is like learning things about the Voynich manuscript. Is that like a uh, a sideshow? Like is that a way that we're distracted by you know by this? I heard a really good take on I like listen to the best of the left podcast. It's basically just clips from other ones. So yeah. I would have to look this up and provide it in the show notes. But um, there was a woman talking about um, how a lot of people believe that we live in this in 1984 society when in reality we live in a brave new world society and what the difference is contextually yes that that was come time <laughs> <laughs> and what it was was that you know uh orwell feared we wouldn't have enough information and um huxley believed that we would be so dumped with information and with with basically death by pleasure i think was the term mm-hmm. um that we would you know basically become lost to what is the useful or meaningful stuff i thought orwell was was afraid of talking pigs <laughs> animal farm is a children's story that's i have a whole take on that all right there's there, there's got to be a um side note there's got to be an entire realm of novels assigned to grade schoolers about um about leftist and socialist stories that are like that are have been his like way way over mis um you know mischaracterized by like clueless audiences like you have everybody from Upton Sinclair to Orwell like getting there because of how they wrote like I guess because they didn't spray paint the message <laughs> of their uh, of their book uh, you know broadly enough everyone you know it was like well you know animal farm is about communism and uh the jungle is about food safety yeah. and um those are the, the high school teacher safe takes they don't want their kids coming home and being like i turned into a leftist today well i think well but the, but it also you gotta remember but the high school teachers themselves were raised 
Yeah, we're, we're pretty much raised in. I think you know they themselves were also. Uh, we're all. I think more than likely, we're also taught. You know, that's how they were taught this thing too. These yeah. are just become you know accepted myths of the um, of the canon. And like playing telephone, the message gets lost over time. Well, and that was the. I mean, if you're talking about the people who are teaching school, like when I was going to high school, I mean, that was they grew up in the height of American conformity. You know what I mean? Like, like we always talk about the hippies and the counterculture, but they were like this small, mm-hmm. tiny group of people, and then and then, you know, the 50s and 60s were when everyone was. Yeah. Ex- you know, everyone was comfortable by being the same. You know what I mean? Whereas now, uh, we're all supposed to be. Well, but that's the thing is, the, uh, you know, hippie counter counterculture only um, only made, you know, at some point, um, I don't know if it was a generational change or whatever, but it was like made made all the people selling, you know, all the manufacturers of regular pop culture, you know, it was like fine. That's you know, it, it made them better. Like here, we will, you know, they, they talk about how like uh, like cities will cities will enshrine and profit off of. Like Banksy insul- uh, installations. Oh yeah. And on that note, let us take a quick break, and we'll be right back. And we're back. Is there an app that plays the Seinfeld bass? Like, yes. When when you command it. Yeah. Where's you know, your air horn? Yeah, I was gonna say, bust out your app, little <laughs> funny app man, because he's the app man. Be bop 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 bop. I'm not your <laughs> dancing <laughs> monkey. Seinfeld. And all those words were just, just, like, just a it was, that was just like a, that was like a base a, a, a collection of like bass samples on like what like a on like a keyboard that's what it sounds like somebody was me. like fucking around with on like on a on an early nineties synth and no app sorry we need studio yeah. laughter actually we can find the laugh track yeah yeah well comic books are an interesting example of how information and ideas can get sort of squashed and compressed and there's this idea that the Riddler went straight for a while actually Two-Face went straight for a while Uh, Penguin uh, was sort of kind of clean and running a nightclub and had dirty dealings on the side and I think he's still doing that to a certain extent in some of them well with the comics you have new blood coming in all the time and they're very interested in the comics they read as a kid and they don't like the way the comics are now, so they change them back, or they have some idea that they've been holding on to for ages, so they want to change it to that. And so you constantly go through this cycle where the characters are sort of changed in one way and then immediately changed back. And it's it creates this weird sensation where nothing is ever constant, but nothing ever changes. Yeah. Because these are big properties, and there are limitations to how much you can experiment with them. And it's ironic because one of the biggest deals in the 80s was The Dark Knight Returns, which was this sort of calcification of some trends that had been going on with Batman where they really cast off the last of the Adam West material. Mm -hmm. And that had been ongoing with stuff like Neil Adams for a long time. But this was sort of the the big resounding moment that really echoed throughout the culture. And the reason that was a big deal was because it was a different version of Batman. Absolutely different. And so when people freak out about stuff like Batman versus Superman, it is a different Batman, but it, it still has sort of those core elements. Yeah. Yeah. My buddy Devin is very much of, of a similar mindset, I think, about it. He doesn't get real down in the dumps about about how it changes because he I think he just acknowledges like this is this is like how you keep this alive. You know what I mean? Yeah. By, by this constant. Uh, um, Nothing is static, right? I mean, you know, and if you you've already, you know, everything has been done before. You you have to update the characters for the, the time and the place that they exist within, and also to be there. I think it's a lot of commentary, right? Like Batman in the eighties became this darker, more complex, psychologically tortured character versus kind of the just the very one dimensional characters from the uh, you know sixties and stuff. Has there been much or any uh, people writing comic fan fiction that that? actually like it influences actually it transcends into yeah. the actual canon or, or what have you well a lot of writers especially female writers that get to do some of the books like the, all the star wars novelists for example in the current new star wars mm-hmm. started out writing fan fiction devin grayson was a writer for nightwing and she was a nightwing fan for ages and ages yep because yep. they love and are so invested in the characters that they know their stories back to front you know that's basically is just 
being an expert on a specific character. But, I well, but, but, but in terms of like, I guess, of like fan creators going from... Um, oh, yeah, I see. I but, see. Sorry. But, but it's also, I think that's... That is, it's been a criticism of like all of the all of the stuff that both Warner Brothers and Disney uh, have been putting out. That um, like the entire point is, um, take you know taking people who are fan, you know, it's you know like like um uh, like you know like letting getting putting J J Abrams in charge, you know, put it in charge of like Star Wars, and but it's like only um you only, you're having. Sometimes letting fans put out the, you know, put out the getting control of the things that they are fans of is not necessarily the best idea because of, I don't know, I think it's, there's, and there's, there's a, there's a, you know, one of my standard unformed thoughts here about um, what are they, you know, what do they necessarily know what they are fans of, much less of the, of how, how do you take that and it's almost like a point of like, of like, Making things uh, like every iteration through over every generate every time you get a new generation of creators on a thing coming through like they're you know they are they are fans of the previous generation who were fans of the previous generation and at some point it's almost like a, like an increasingly superficial take upon take of that and um, unless you get so it's what, like a like a what's that oh, fuck shit <laughs> that Baudrillard <laughs> concept what what is it called where the the map becomes the terrain, so to speak. Oh, are you, uh, are you talking about the Matrix? Yes, I'm talking about the Matrix. Cool, I like that movie. Um, Basically, like a copy of a copy of a copy. A simulacrum. Yeah. I like, think so. I haven't. I haven't read. I haven't read any Wilder Art, but it's. But yeah, I think it's. But it's. It's a. It's a. It's a narrowing of it. It's kind of like. Um, no, that 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 that. Like a lim- well, a narrowing or a limiting of imagination of it too. I definitely don't know enough about comics to talk about it but in that regard. I think, so I think you have a good point there because I think a lot of so what happens is that you get a bunch of content that doesn't have any significant like storytelling or weight or characterization to it, where it just becomes a repeat of of uh, it just becomes Tropes. like surface level trope. Right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's like it's hey. super weird that superheroes and comics are still beating up muggers. Like <laughs> exactly. I mean, muggers muggers That's a great suck, point. but I. That we are a long way from the very, very 1980s epidemic of muggings in New right. York, and it's also super weird that Batman has a butler. If Batman were a real person, he would have a personal assistant. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, and we we have all these, oh, we have all this detritus that basically builds up on these characters and calcifies them. Yeah, it like it's similar. I think which is almost at some point that is weird that he still has a butler. I never even thought about that. Yeah, maybe Alfred just likes to cosplay as a butler, but he's what, actually a person. But it's, yeah, it's like one of the things where you have when these things when these ideas first get formed, it's almost like they get calcified, you know, cal- trapped in amber in the particular in the particularities of the time they were formed in. Batman is you have the concept of Batman. He was a rich dude created in nineteen what thirty eight thirty nine. When did what thirty nine? Didn't it? Batman shows up in 1939. Yeah, it's in the 30s somewhere. Pre, yeah. You know, very you know, golden era, golden golden age, pre war era. So he is, you know, he is a, he is a he's a posh rich boy, which means he has certain trappings like this kind of you know stately Wayne. You know, he's got a stately Wayne manner. He's got the he has the butler slash driver slash mechanic and all these things. But it's kind of like uh, see, it's similar. It is it's similar to how in this point I was reading somewhere of like people's idea about what the working class is is guy is middle aged white dudes in hard hats because that is what the yeah. when the, when the idea when the idea of when the first, when the idea of like the working class is for you know and especially increasing power and visibility happened was in the early part of the 20th century when that's what it looked like so it's kind of like just the arbitrary the the arbitrary aspects of that that particular time become the defining moment of what this thing is similar you know i mean it goes back to say batman being like this rich guy it's like all of the the tra- the, the tropes and the trappings of batman in the 21st century are still the tropes and the trappings of Batman in 1939. Yeah. Of like, this is, oh, in terms of, he's not just a rich dude, um, you know, rich dude, heir, you know, billionaire heir, head of whatever. But um, it's like, the you know, he's, we know, we know what, well, yeah, we have a rough idea of what a, uh, of like a 21st century billionaire looks like and is. But and as you said, Batman is still, you know, still has a butler and is still beating up street muggers. You need to drop in the clip from the Justice League trailer where I think the Flash asks him. What are your superpowers again? 
I'm rich. Yeah. Uh, also, I think that going back to Watchmen, uh, Night Owl was a perfect, like, uh, good idea of somebody being rich that bought everything that he could and made everything that he could to be it's, he's basically batman in that mm-hmm. world right yeah. but he's also incredibly lonely and like like hermited and his only friend is the previous night owl and he I, has trouble getting erections yeah i was yes. gonna say uh uh sexual sexually dysfunctional can only and has to dress up in the suit yeah. has to dress up in the suit and has to commit like you know visible you know it's kind of is that vi- who participates in that notorious sex scene from that film oh, yes yeah. okay hallelujah <laughs> oh god i i just watched that i just want to hear that song <laughs> fucking let her go all the fucking but, time but, but that's the thing is like at some point what even in well even in the comic like the two of the like uh night owl and silk specter yeah whatever, like it's like you know after they get you know the first time they're you know both like 40 something heroes at that point after they're kind of like you know both of them are so so like you know they they have the street this 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 they you know they get preyed upon in this alleyway because again you know we're, it's 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 set in new york in new york 1985 so yeah. street muggers in an alleyway come at them and they beat them up and they're so sexually charged with this but isn't there a shot in isn't there a panel of like them actually like both having a cigarette like after yes like after the uh the encounter i believe the panel is that uh, Dan is looking away to the left, uncomfortable, rustling his hair, and mm-hmm. she's actually looking to the right, lighting uh, that weird pipe that she smokes. Mm. Okay. Yeah. And I damn, you do have a good memory. Yeah. That that is that is um, even you know Alan Moore you know like I said Alan Moore was showing at some point you know because of like how the this alternate universe was you know advanced from the real world 1985 even in this kind of like dystopic alt you know nixon you know nixon as permanent president alternate dystopic world you know they were they were well they were fortunate in that vaping was much earlier so <laughs> vape life one of the things i really admire about alan moore is that he's persistently willing to think through things oh yeah and so even with something like swamp thing which was a title that nobody really took that seriously he went and did the research he dug up the information and he found out what kind of plants were in the territory that swamp thing lived and he put in a tremendous amount of effort to think about what are the tropes what are the stereotypes and what are the assumptions did he did he create swamp thing or did he do the really interesting Mm -hmm. reboot of swamp thing he did the anatomy lesson which basically turned the whole concept on its head and said that swamp thing wasn't really alec holland okay yeah, he Swamp Thing wasn't really out of clone. He was a what a plant creature who thought he was the scientist who you know fell into the muck, yeah. with, surrounded by chemicals. Yeah, Devin, our mutual friend Devin, explained it to me once, and though it wasn't exactly his explanation, wasn't exactly what you just said. Yeah, that's what I was. That's what I was thinking about. And but yeah, but that but that particular that that evolution. Is kind of and the um, as well as like an enhanced character study, which when did he start writing on Swamp Thing? Was it late seventies or early? It was like like early eighties, I think. It was the, early eighties. Yeah, early eighties. But that that led into I think he was the if not the sole at least the forefront of the of that certain of that generation of British writers and uh, writers coming over that would eventually get built into like vertigo comics was Absolutely. which was the best thing that DC did for you know outside of yeah Neil Gaiman then God, I, can't, no, I, I was, was going to say, I'm trying to remember what the uh, you know, best thing that DC ever did outside of like Walt Simonson's run on Thor, but that was a Mar- that was Marvel. Um, I can't even think of what the standout DC, I don't know, what the standout DC thing was up until Vertigo. And, you know, I guess it was also, you know, uh, Dark Knight Returns and Watchmen, but because... There were, there were those comics where uh, Supergirl's horse was desperate to have sex with her. That was Those were pretty good. Oh, my God. Oh, that dang. Exists? Oh yeah, I'm looking at that. That horse was thirsty. <laughs> I'm hoping they bring that in the TV show. That'd be great. And they and they with, and they still and they still do the um and they yeah they but they still use the peanut butter so that it talks. Well, to be to be clear, like the horse was actually a person that had been turned into a horse. I want to say by like a wizard. I don't remember exactly. I, I just, yeah, this like predates okay. Usenet. Yeah, I'm so glad the internet did not exist at that time because you wow. know somebody would be making art and horrific of it yeah well so i mean comics are i've always been fascinated by comics and particularly superheroes because they are these 
big, dumb, simple ideas, and it's interesting to see how people explore them through the lens of the era they live in. But these notions are not just in fiction. They are... These these stereotypes are everywhere. They're I mean, universal. These yeah, are we have this. Tales. We have this idea of the union worker, but we also have varying ideas about what a feminist looks like, for example. And yeah, the the, yeah, the but the images that were that were just fr- you know the, the, the calcified just from the particular moments when pr- feminists showed up. And got a lot of media attention at you know various points along mm-hmm. you know along the, the way of history. I like when a feminist wears a T-shirt that tells me what a feminist looks like, uh, so that I know. Yeah, I really appreciate that. Well, there are people who do not appreciate that and will post on YouTube oh, about how offended they are yeah. uh, that yeah, somebody was wearing that kind of a shirt. Yeah, they ask me about my feminist agenda shirt that uh, that well, yeah. I'm not familiar with this T-shirt. Oh, it's it's just one of those many things where people are commodifying and marketing. Yeah, protests. You can buy resistance. You yeah. can buy revolution. Yeah, yeah they can market it. I us. feel like the last ten years or so are an era where basically everybody graduated from their media literacy class, <laughs> and suddenly everybody appreciates symbols now. Everybody appreciates that you can put spin on something and have it mean what you want it to mean and everyone's so excited about this and i'm like welcome to the party pal yeah Um, and so nothing is neutral anymore every single thing has to have an angle to it so you have websites that are devoted to presenting neutral information with a very clear bias and to a certain extent i celebrate that because i would rather have information where i know what the agenda is coming at me yeah they've laid, they have laid their cards on the table that yeah this is i mean this is our stance but this you know they're not they're not trying to you know they're they're clear that I, they, you know they're not fronting as it were i thought you were saying that they were fronting that they're that they're trying to pretend that they don't have a perspective but but you know that they have a perspective and they try to use facts well i mean sometimes they pretend but to anybody who has even a modicum of common sense, when Infowars.com comes up to you and they're like, how do you feel about the fact that Bernie Sanders is raping America to death? I think you can probably right. do the math no, on that. Yeah, I yeah. just wanted to clarify that that's what you were saying, because well, I think Jeremy was saying you were saying the opposite, that, that they're upfront about their perspective. It, it's it's Jeremy's show. He's right. Yeah. Oh, okay. I, I, always I, defer I would to have the to host. say, like, if you even just trying to read Washington Post or New York Times, just not the opinion section either, just normal articles. Now that I'm woke, you know, <laughs> <laughs> no, not really. I'm not. Um, but now that I'm, I'm able this to see kind of the, the, like. the liberal agenda on that, it's very hard for me to read those things because I will be instantly just turned off by the language that's used. Right. We have this sort of dehumanization within like this, with this, with this air of superiority and, you know, like knowledge, like we're hard hitting journalists and, you know, whatever. But and then you end up chasing down, Russian ties to, you know, right. U.S. elections. Yeah, well, you know, we talked last time I was here about Joss Whedon. Yeah. And Joss Whedon, it turns out, is also, everybody's thirsty lately. I don't... <laughs> I think, <laughs> yeah, he, he hit, hit, hit it pretty well. I, that, that whole story made me laugh so hard about how... So did you, you guys hear about that? Joss, well, uh, no. Joss Whedon's wife separated from him. Nice. Divorced him. Like, like 15 years or something? He would, yeah, they were together 15 years, and she came out with a little bit of a tell-all, I think, or was it a book? It was like a f- Instagram or post. Or just Instagram think, post, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just the, <laughs> the extended, just the methods that we reveal our, that we were, you know, our tell-all secrets today. Yeah. Not a, uh, not, it's not, an, not an Inquirer exclusive, not a, uh, not a, not a, not a, not a 60 minutes sit down segment <laughs> not a frost nixon series um facebook post right yeah it was it's a facebook post jeremy i have to say i love when you do your i'm practicing trumpet laugh yeah. into the microphone and I'm, <laughs> i sincerely mean that i love it so anyway um, I, i'm i'm charlie rose now you say your your husband was very thirsty is that correct <laughs> tell me about how thirsty it's hard to do a charlie rose impression. and i understand that he was trying to Slide into DMs, is that correct? <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, so Joss 
apparently was having many affairs and cool whatever do you but i guess she wasn't really in on the, the joke when she found out and then she had to stay with him or something i don't know what happened Dang. But he he basically blamed patriarchy for causing him to lust after beautiful that, young women that he worked with that's so funny um jacques derrida uh said he blamed christianity for the fact that he couldn't cheat on his wife <laughs> He, he he said that 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 monogamy was imposed upon the Jews by the Christians. I thought, like, what a fucking weasel, dude! Like, what a fucking charlatan! I'm sorry, I hate Jacques Derrida. That is yeah. all. Well, I mean, this yeah, this sounds amazing. What are you talking about? This is basically the inventor of the modern age, Derrida. Yeah, I mean that that is. Something I would expect to hear in a in a YouTube video. I, I, that is beautiful. <laughs> well, that's very true. So, so I mean, and especially in the United States, you know, a lot of people took what he said and ran with it. And and actually, the interesting thing to me is how well the right wing has taken those same ideas, exactly. even though they're the ideas that they malign. You know, the 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 you know, you know, I mean. I don't. I don't want to get too deep into it, but yeah. but uh, we'll have a theory episode. I think that'd be great. Well, I don't know if I can talk well enough about Derry Duck because I can't stand him. But uh, <laughs> you have to hate Reed. It, yeah, it, it, yeah. It, it's Derrida. Derrida. Yeah. Derrida tater tots. <laughs> Rhymes with vagina. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> But I'm 13 years old today. Getting, I love getting, it. Getting back real quick to Joss Whedon, the thing about that whole fiasco that I found frustrating, and to be clear, I'm not pro affair. Uh, I, I just think that no, it's not anybody's unless, business. Unless I'm, um, <laughs> and I, I don't think blaming your problems on the patriarchy is cool. But at the same point, everybody's saying, well, actually, if you look at his work, it's obvious that he was a misogynist, the crypto misogynist, if you will, the entire time. And I'm like, <laughs> no, come, come on. No. Like, yeah, that's annoying. First starters, TV shows are created by groups of people. And some of the most problematic episodes of Buffy, I'm pretty sure were actually written by Marty Noxon. She has oh, a really? yeah, real recurring thing that comes up with abusive relationships. She, she's and, the one that put the whole Spike Buffy thing with the she was shown on her at the time, yeah. Yeah, that's so. Yeah, yeah. Women can be complicit you, in this kind of stuff. Could you unpack that a little bit? Yeah, like one of some of the problematic stuff is um, just that they had a, a an attempted sexual assault that didn't happen, but like was going to, was going to happen mm -hmm. from Spike to Buffy, and just because they had had sex before, and he was thirsty, as he do. So vampires have working yes. junk. Okay, very good working junk apparently oh yeah they have show. well it depends on what universe you're talking about in the twilight universe they have like one left over in the chamber <laughs> <laughs> well and that, and that was his first time right so mm -hmm. he had that one shot one shot one opportunity yeah and he's a very he's a very mormon vampire yeah um anyway but it, there's a lot of the writing you know it, it's it's not feminist right i think a lot of women a lot of male writers like to take female pain, especially sexual assault, mm. and try to do some kind of commentary on it. But in, in general, it's presented without any kind of true, you know, it's, it's not done respectfully, typically. Yeah, and it's, it's very troubling. And it's very not something that we want to see a beloved character doing. It's like uh, T was talking about that on Champagne yeah. Sharks, about how we can talk about black suffering. Like, white people love stories about black suffering uh, because it... It makes us feel like we're engaging with black suffering in some way, but we don't like stories about black celebration or black uh, yeah. triumph or anything exactly. like that. Exactly, it's right? it's a it's kind of a false empathy, right? <sighs> or a, like a maybe just a it's just sort of it's it's not speaking to the actual experiences of people that have lived it. Like like we think it's we think it's enlightened to be like oh look I'm connecting with with black suffering when I watch Moonlight or whatever. Mm -hmm. But but really what we're doing is saying, well, black people are going to continue to fill the role of being the people who oh, suffer. Oh, the victim, yeah. Um, and, and, and that's it, essentially, right? Is like the victim yeah, I mean, is idea? it similar to what it you're is talking exactly, about? That's yeah. what I'm, I'm talking Because when you, when you frame a narrative as, a, when you, you frame a, a strong character, especially a woman, as a victim continuously, that is, and the, these these kind of experiences that are, you know they are shared universally by a lot of many women, but they are not something that we want to really explore in fiction typically. It, unless it's done with tact and care, and on a weekly television show, that's not going to happen. You know, it's it, and it's 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 almost like making it a trope. So is it? Were, do people give Whedon credit because they're saying he was showcasing female suffering? Is that? 
Well, no, they, they give him a lot of... Uh, it's either... It's, there's a very mixed opinion on the way that he presents female characters as being... You know, it's like they're strong, but they're constantly getting beaten up, you know, whatever. He has, you know, it's almost like fetishization in a way, but I think... Yeah, I, I mean, I, I, can I, do the, I can do this in my sleep. The problem with Buffy is that Buffy is taking a character and giving her powers, but rather than giving her powers that would more comfortably fit into a feminist yes. uh, perspective... They, she's being given traditionally masculine abilities, namely to beat the shit out of people. Yeah, perfect. Um, and you know, at the time, it was it was revolutionary. It was something that, as a young girl, my you know thirteen year old me loved it because, of course, you just don't have that representation growing up in you know action movies and TV mm. shows were all you know. So having a female centered story, that's great that he focused on that. I have no problems with the fact that he did a lot of the work that I like. And I'm even a dollhouse apologist. And that show is complicated, problematic as fuck, all this shit, right? But Dollhouse is, I think, a lot like Sucker Punch in as much as yeah. I think people aren't willing to give it the benefit of the doubt. Exactly. They just assume it's basically slavery and rape. So Which it is. Which it is. But I, I and I think that one got undercut a lot by the marketing for it, where they were like Check out these super sexy, sexy. brainwashed ladies who have no ability yeah. to consent <laughs> tonight on Fox. Yes, exactly. God, just imagine had like, HBO done that. Oh, it would HBO have been did do that with Westworld. Yeah. Okay, that was that's that's where I thought it was of um, the aim of Dollhouse was slightly off. Well, not slightly off. It's you know it's considerably different than what it was for Westworld, and you know it was yeah. Just, the vision of the show, actually, if you watch, they had to, of course, cancel it, but he actually did 20 years in the future. And the whole point of the show was that eventually everybody would be subject to this technology and you'd be controlled by the government or the powers that be by this remote brainwashing, basically. Mm -hmm. And so that, to me, was a cool concept that could have been explored very artfully if done well, but, you know... We only got what we got, and it, yeah. I think there are some really good elements to that show, but I'd have to, I don't want to bore you with the details. Yeah, well, so the the thing I find frustrating is that Buffy can't be a character in her own right anymore. She yeah. has to be this feminist symbol that stands for all women. Joss Whedon has to stand for all men. Hillary Clinton has to stand for all women. Yeah, And I, I believe it was, uh, his name is uh, Roland Barthes. Roland Barthes wrote a really interesting essay about wrestling mm -hmm. and how the wrestlers embody these certain characteristics. And this is why I was always uh, fascinated by gossip, which is when we talk about Taylor Swift, we're not really talking about Taylor Swift. We're talking about the archetypal good girl, mm -hmm. and we're talking about the archetypal somewhat unhinged black man when we talk about Kanye. Mm -hmm. And so we don't really talk about these people as people. We talk about them as symbols. Exactly. And I guess I have seen over the last decade or so a strange development in the culture where everything is symbolic now. Yes. And to a certain extent, as a writer and somebody who is very passionate about literary theory, I celebrate this. But on the other hand, I think it has some really profoundly toxic effects. It Are, does. How much of that is similar to the, the uh, you know, the idea of like, of what is what I think Freddie DeBoer called it critique drift, and you like oh, and because we've mentioned well not we've mentioned both the pro wrestler Barth's thing before in our episode on kayfabe earlier this year. You know, check your podcast feed, ladies and gentlemen. You can see it back there in, um, in the pot, in the episode name, but also. Whenever and whenever a new idea pops up, it's like new ideas um, pop up online, and like these shiny new tools. And it's, it's at some point, it's kind of a thing where everyone sees like, oh wow, this is great. And I think this is I don't know think we necessarily all indulge in this. I think we sure as shit of our are all susceptible to it. Of like, it's kind of like someone who finds out about plot holes the very first time. It is it's uh, it's like the what is it? It's 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 akin to like you know the, the freshman year psychology student who is suddenly introduced to the idea of like oh there's this book called the DSM and it's time to now diagnose my roommate. Um, <laughs> but you get but I think well you're talking about in terms of like the last ten years of getting these of where like this expanded. You know these expanded concepts go to. I think that was that that hit the same time as like not only social media expanding, but also 
um, you know, the hot take industry building, you know, like I said, the industrialization that, that, that built upon social media where like the entire point was they, they need, you know, everybody had, you know, journalism crashed and burned. So it expanded, it went, it went online and took the much more of like the takes industry. And so you had a lot, a lot of people who needed to churn out this much stuff. So they just started grabbing concepts that you in you know, critical, you know, critical tools or whatnot without necessarily having done the reading or having done the practice. But it was like, hey, here are these cool ideas. And so they have started applying these things to it. So you now had a bunch of more, um, they, they start, you know, the, they started uh, applying these like, uh, you know, like, like literal lit crit theory to all, everything, but, re but without the context or without the background of, you know, the, the how, you know, how, you know, it's like, Without without being able to say sh to shade it properly of like how much should this reading how much credence do you want to put in this reading and how much should you cut it's, it's kind of a thing of like being um, the one of the side effects of like getting into martial arts and saying if you of like being you know eventually making it to say being becoming a black belt is that yeah you have all these, these like you know these life ending. You know, you, you you know, you can kill a guy now, but along the way, you have built up, you have hopefully built up the the internal structure and like judgment and maturity that you know you know not you know when not to use this stuff. So you're saying people have been given the black belt without yeah working their way up the tiers is basically it's like people... from a, from a cultural criticism perspective, right? It's... Well, if there's one thing we all know, it's you know MMA fighters are very restrained, thoughtful, mature <laughs> individuals. Mm -hmm. I was just thinking of like all of the, uh, you know, your Mary Sue or Jezebel takes on media from a feminist perspective, but it's like missing the actual analysis. Like that's basically what I, what makes me tick was just, you know, looking at that crap, um, like Beauty and the Beast is Stockholm Syndrome or like all these kind of like, like buzz, these buzzy like takes on things uh -huh. that don't, when you read them, there's no, there's just putting two and two well, things together without actually deconstructing uh, that. I think maybe in a related way, I was really confused on what gaslighting was. And I think it's because I read enough things where people who were writing didn't really know what gaslighting yes. was. <laughs> and and <laughs> I felt like an idiot or like I wasn't. Uh, no, uh, I think people were using that word. It became like a big word to use uh, last year. And a lot of people were using it without and, any and, fucking clue. And, and, and a meant. friend of the show and my special lady, McKendry Thompson, set me straight on what gaslighting was. Oh, but great. I had to ask her. Her about it because it was like, isn't it when uh, you uh... <laughs> gaslighting is when you put a flashlight in your mouth and you turn it on, and you puff out your cheeks so they glow, right? I, like it. I don't. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's what that was the the understanding I was laboring about. Yeah, it's it's yeah. it's an old movie. I think Gaslight is a 1940s movie about a guy who puts I'm... a flashlight in it. A... Yeah. <laughs> no, it's he he basically what he ha what happens is that he's trying to to make his wife think that she's crazy. Right. Well, I mean that would. Certainly make me think that. Yeah, I, th I think putting a flashlight in your really house. Awesome. Oh. Yeah, that then that movie was, of course, <laughs> the fault in our stars. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> callback. All right, and on and on that callback, uh, let us take a break. And do we want to do like recommendations, or how are you guys feeling? Uh, I can do it, but let's let's we should try to rapid fire it. Mine are mostly old anyway. Uh, I did want to jump in though on one more thing. One of the things that really drove me nuts is there's this comic that's coming out where the Joker is a good guy. Oh. And Batman is a bad guy, and somebody was very mad, and he was like, "This is another example of how the SJWs are <laughs> taking advantage <laughs> of these classic characters and abusing them because we have to feel feel sorry for people who are mentally ill now. I mean, what's the idea that the Joker <laughs> is suddenly a good guy? He's going to be cured of all his. And then he's like, "Also, this is an Elseworlds," and I was like, "Well, Elseworlds are alternate universe stories, you son of a bitch. Why are you mad? Like, why does this have to be it's something that AU, you're man. freaking out about? I mean." One of my all-time favorite books is Contact. Yes, me uh -huh. too. And I can't imagine how badly people would freak out if that book came out today. They'd be like, oh, really? Oh, you're going to have a woman be a scientist in your book? Wow, okay. Way to, <laughs> way to indoctrinate us with your SJW agenda, dude. Cool. Yeah, women don't go into STEM, you know? Yeah. Uh, the connecting back to earlier about Buffy as can't just be a character. All things have to be connected. What's like, yes, all things are you know, come from a context and aren't necessarily connected to it, but only able to handle these characters and they're talking about them as like, you know, signifiers of, of like huge, huge, you know, huge, whatever. Um, it's at some point, it's kind of like, it's not only, not only dealing with the character, not only dealing with the characters or, you know, 
dealing with the stuff at, or even like you know celebrities as caricature but using caricatures of you know using using caricatures of like the critical tools or the critical the concepts you're using char- you're using a caricature of a technique to you know to write about uh you know popular caricatures mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. it's when head canon and fan canon become quote unquote fact all right and or uh, yeah, all right. So um, transition. You you want to take a break or just do our? Uh, I can do. I can take a break. Okay, let's do a quick break and we'll be right back. All right. And on that note, uh, we are now into the closest thing to a regular segment we have on the show: endorsements and or recommendations for. Stuff that we have been uh, enjoying and want to share with others. Uh, does anyone want to go first? I can go first. Uh, I've got four, but I just want to, I'll do them really quick. So I'm going to do three old things. Uh, one is that uh, uh, because I'm turning into a an old person, I like jazz now. Um, and I'd like to recommend a record by the jazz guitarist Kenny Burrell. It's called Say Listen. Uh, the track, the title track, Say Listen, is incredible. It's I, It would be considered like hard bop. That's the type of jazz it is. Um, if you like that sort of shit, check it out. Uh, I, I saw the movie Whiplash last night. It was a very celebrated mm-hmm. movie from a few years ago. That movie is almost fucking perfect. Mm-hmm. That is like the experience I want to have at the movies. If you haven't seen it, please see it. Uh, I just want to jump in here. Whiplash is just a remake of Secretary. Oh, that is kind of true. It is kind of a remake of Secretary. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's my that's my hot take. You're that's right, but take. it's an excellent movie. It's a better movie than Secretary. Yeah. Uh, um, mm. Hud, mm. Hudsucker mm. Proxy is one of the less talked about uh, uh, Coen Brothers films, but I I just I saw that recently again, and God, what a terrific movie! And finally, something new: uh, the heartwarming tale called Patty Cakes. I saw it the other day and absolutely loved it. It's like Rocky, but uh, with a White girl trying to rap, oh my and God. I like it better than Rocky. So uh, that's all. Wow, I hadn't heard of that one before. But yeah, it's very, it's very heartwarming. I, I, it's very, I, I'm, I'm an old man, and I want to just see something that's charming and heartwarming. Yeah, it is, I, love I like it. things that lack cynicism most of the time. <laughs> um, speaking of which, uh, I have been watching the new Twin Peaks, and I am almost three quarters of the way through, and it is pure Lynch, pure pure wonderfulness uh everyone that's in it shines obviously i'm really glad they have uh, laura dern as a major character because i love her so much um have you guys been watching it at all or heard anything about it no and I'm, I'm i'm planning on watching it and starting it soon yeah I, I, I haven't seen the original twin peaks so i'm pretty sure it's pronounced Watch that first i'm pretty sure it's pronounced david lunch yes david lunch yeah. david uh quote unquote naked lunch <laughs> anyway, um, I won't talk too much about that because that'll just bore people since it's such dream logic shit. Um, but I watched Atomic Blonde recently. Ooh, tell me more. Oh my god, I'm I'm a sucker for these. Tell me like... more. Tell me more. <laughs> Did she put up a fight? <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, the choreography. I mean, the, the the fight choreography, as usual, it's from the guys that did john wick and uh, also the guys that give you the hallway scene in Daredevil season one. Um, it's done so well. They don't treat her like a woman with a man's strength. They treat her like a woman who's just like tough as nails, been like been training her entire life. And, and also, but she's, she gets, um, she just, the fights that they have are just feel like real fights. Mm-hmm. And like, it's also, it's very um, true to like that eighties spy craft kind of like coolness. And that's right before the fall of the Berlin wall. So there's like this really interesting kind of setting for the, the place cool. that, that goes on in it. It's just really good. I loved it. The whole woman fighting thing is something that people get really excited about. They're like, well, you know, a woman is small and you know, couldn't possibly. <laughs> I'm like, motherfucker, have you ever heard of Bruce Lee? Yeah. Like that dude was tiny. Yeah, not I a mean, big dude. And, and Charlize, man, she's like 42. But she's fuck and you just ripped and they just show her in the, the film like just in these ice baths with like, all these bruises over her like there's mm-hmm. a kind of a realism to it and a kind of a hurt to it it's really good um what was my last one darn it oh i was going to recommend the dead pundit society because we've, we've been talking about it a lot but mm-hmm. specifically the one last episode that he had uh the author of the perils of privilege phoebe maltz bovey who was covered it we covered that in a previous episode um that was just a really, really good episode if you for a launch pad if you want to get into that show. But he has interviews with a lot of uh, very influential leftist thinkers and done with a very kind of professional and, and like careful like kind of way because I know we're all afraid of being called out. Um, 
I thought that they, they handled that topic, which was very sensitive, very well. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Groovy. That's it. Uh, you want to go? Take I don't on. actually have anything to recommend. I've been consuming a lot of media, and I just watched all of BoJack Horseman in one <laughs> season, but like I continue to hate that show. <laughs> so a not, I, could, uh, I couldn't get into it. A rare non-endorsement of BoJack Horseman. Yeah, I want to say go ahead and skip BoJack Horseman. It's basically, what if a rich white guy was sad, but... <laughs> Oh no, we don't want to tell a story like that because it would be morning cliche, so we'll just make him a horse and we'll call us out on our bullshit. I wanted to recommend Barkles.dog. Oh, yeah. Oh, that website is so hot. I can't wait for it to go up. I keep forgetting how much I love that. Yeah, Barkles.dog is basically Verit, only it's for the all, it's for the whole country. Okay. Yeah, it's social media for the entire country. The 300 million? Yeah. For yeah. All, it's, it's, <laughs> 315 million or whatever it is. It's a four it's a four quadrant uh comic. Yeah. And uh I watched Dunkirk, but I wouldn't really necessarily recommend that either cuz it's a really miserable experience. Like it's a well-made film and I enjoyed watching it, but it's kind of hard for me to recommend it to other people just because it's it's more of a disaster horror survival film, yeah, which yeah. is not going to be to everybody's taste. Um, and let's see what else. Uh, I'm playing a lot of Overwatch. You can wreck a game on here. Huh? Yeah, I don't think. I, I, well, I can't recommend that in good conscience because you know I don't want to create more 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 Warcraft widows. <laughs> <laughs> Who's I'm a Warcraft widower. Yeah. Whoa. We exist too. It, it's a it's a recurring gag where people basically were losing significant others to World of Warcraft. Mm -hmm. Who's your uh, who, who do you mainly play in Overwatch? Who's your main? So I'm a huge fan of Tracer, mm -hmm. and I also like Arisa for tank, and I prefer Lucio for healing. Although it's really it depends on the map. Gotcha. Cool. Yeah. Uh, some of you out there will understand what he said completely. A lot of us, uh, plenty of others will not. Uh, my suggestion is, uh, um, don't worry about it. It's okay. <laughs> video but, video games are trash. Yeah, video games. video games. Yeah. I'm starting up a Twitch channel pretty soon, so be on the lookout for that. Ooh, nice. Awesome. Yeah. I really do. It's got. I was trying to think. Of, I don't think I've actually. I don't think I. I don't think I've played Overwatch since. Like was it what was it the was it the full was it when did they have that free weekend was it the full like the beta or the open I can't remember it's been I think it was like last year that I played I just started last month so. yeah um and I just finished Secret Empire from Marvel which is also a strong oh, yeah. not to recommend it's yeah. what if <laughs> Captain America was a Nazi but Captain America was also not a fictional character but in, like the Marvel Universe character so it's like what if but in the real world. Oh my god! And at the end, it turns out that uh, they go into his brain and bring out like an idealized version of Captain America that isn't a Nazi, and then that version beats up Nazi Captain America. <laughs> the fuck? Yeah, it's real dumb. Yeah, is... everything I've seen online about that. Oh, spoilers for Secret Empire. Is we're in what happens to Falcon Cap in that? Uh, as far as I know, he's going to go back to being Falcon, but he helps because he. Uh, gives Captain America the Nazi version a shard from the Cosmic Cube that lets Bucky jump into his brain. Oh, well, interesting. It's pretty incoherent. Yeah. And you know, like I like I said last time I was here, I really enjoyed the high concept of taking this sacred symbol and subverting it and I feel to a certain extent that's sort of what's happening in our, in our modern politics of where we're taking yeah. this, you know, the esteemed office of president and basically... Ugh. Imagine what it would be like if there was a Nazi there. Uh, well, I'm, again, I'm not going to go there, but basically taking something sacred and making it profane, yes. which is a very old and venerable symbolic literary idea. Exactly, yeah. But in both cases, I, I don't think I'm enjoying the execution too much. Yeah. You have to be very careful with really, you know... How, like complicated topics like that. Yeah, so I'm going to go ahead and not recommend any of those four things. Great. Except for Overwatch. You, you, um... No, not, no, no. Okay. I don't think he wants any other competition, though. You know, I, I don't want anybody stealing my Hanzo. <laughs> Hanzo steal. My recommendation is a book came out within the last year um, called Lovecraft Country by Matt Ruff. 
Fun. It was a Seattle writer. It's nice. a it is the book that um, recently announced that Jordan Peele is going to be, I think, exec producing the uh, the adaptation for HBO. And the book itself is very. It's set in 1954, and it is kind of like it's it's almost an anthology, but it's it's pretty much it, the book involves a kind of like an extended black family in having you know having to deal to to deal with. Almost like Lovecraftian type horrors, but alongside, uh, you know, you know, alongside just the horrors of just Jim Crow America. Mm-hmm. And there's and there's and so it's kind of a thing where you where and but it's also it is it is it's a nice genre story because there's actually like several little like sub little love Lovecrafty type uh, like genre stories that happen. Like each chapter t- uh, focuses on a different member of the family. And it builds on itself, and it's great for that thing. But it becomes, you know, they're all like little sub sub adventures in like one big story. And um, uh, but it's 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 something like because it the, it's one of those stories where the protagonists are genre fans of the genre they are in. Like it's like it's it, which is almost which it's self aware. It, yeah, well, in a certain sense, well, they're not like self aware and like, hey, this sounds, no. this feels yeah. exactly like. But it's like they are. It, it's almost like a Stephen King thing where like you have the protagonist, you know, like the, the the protagonist is like a, you know, he, you know, he's a uh, he is you know he's a uh, a black Korean War veteran, but he was also kind of like you know, ra- you know, grew up reading like all of uh, reading Pulp Fiction. Okay, so like everything from like Burroughs to. Um, you know, to Lovecraft, who like you know, uh, golden era sci-fi. Wait, well, did, the, did the character actually read Lovecraft? Yes. Okay, that's awesome. Well, and this, uh, this if if I can just jump in for a second, this sure. touches on what we've been talking about throughout the episode, which is this idea of us struggling with knowledge because it's increasingly difficult for us to tell stories where people aren't genre savvy. It's the scream problem right. where. You know, we've all seen these horror movies. Why are you going to the basement? We've all read Lovecraft. Why are you touching that egg? <laughs> or reading that book. <laughs> that which is like which is some of the, that's the that's what it was what like one of the criticisms of one of the criticisms of like Walking Dead is in it is like Walking Dead is a, is a universe is a zombie story in a universe where zombie stories don't exist. Exactly. Um. But like I said, uh, Lovecraft Country. Great book, very entertaining. Um, not only it talks about it's like both kind of like I said, it mixes both like the uh, the, the the I guess the real world historical well like not 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 so historical horror, horror, but also with like some sort of like um, some sort of like Lovecraftian tropes. But also there's there's commentary on the fact that you have um, you know a black family of a lot who a lot of the members you know or like you know comic you know the, at one point one of the one of the younger member you know draws his own comic books mm-hmm. for his for for his auntie you know who loves the stuff but at the same time talking about how you know especially for God one would even say now there aren't as many like you know black uh, science fiction um, creators as there should be. Especially in you know, not to mention how you know the Darth of them back then. So it's kind of there's there's a bit of there's a bit of almost um, explicit criticism of being you know being fans of being fans of a genre where you where before where you had absolutely no representation of yourself of, mm-hmm. which I guess kind of like yeah that's, that 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 thought kind of makes sense. <laughs> All right, uh, and that is pretty much that. If um, let's see, uh, where can anybody else have anything, anything to promote, or where can they find you if you want to give your contact info or not? Otherwise, um... Um, one of my uh, bands, Honky Tonk Union, we just uh, we have a new EP, and we also have a revamped website at honkytonkunion dot com. Uh, you can find both the website itself and the EP at that website. Uh, and uh, I'm taking a class at Portland State on Immanuel Kant in the fall. So if you want to join me and be my study friend, maybe we could do that. But the term will have started by the time this drops, so I shouldn't have said that. <laughs> um, I'm at Ashes for Foxes on Twitter and Tumblr. That's about it. <laughs> but you, you know, DM slide into my DMs. I'm always oh waiting my. to hear from you. Oh jeez me. I'm at Jacob Mercy. I'm social media manager for Barkles.dog. I love Barkles.dog. It's so great. 
All right. And uh, once again, I'd like to thank the Mysterious Breakfast Sailor for uh, use for the theme song. Um, you can contact us at facebook.com giving, slash giving the mic or on Twitter, giving the mic. Yeah. It, uh, e- if you have any questions, comments, whatever, email us at giving the mic at Gmail. And I think that is pretty much it. So oh, wait, no, I thought of a recommendation. Norse breakfast. Very good. Woody. Yeah. The sons of Norway here in Portland, uh, put on a lovely Sunday breakfast, um, it's I think it's every like second to last Sunday or something like that. Yeah, if you're in Portland, check it out. If you're not in Portland, stay away. Mm-hmm. The, the uh, yeah, the, these over at the Norse Hall on Cooch and like what tenth, the uh, second Sunday of every month, they have a Viking pan an all you can eat Viking pancake breakfast for like eight bucks. Eight right? bucks less for children. Yeah. yeah, watch out for the crazy guy who's screaming and trying to punch Ricardo. <laughs> you will have to go around him. Yeah. He's not There's actually one of those always in He's not actually in the Norris Hall though. We should we should add. He's in the parking lot. Yeah. No, he, yeah, you encounter him along the way. All right, thank you ladies and gentlemen. Um final words of the other night. Good night. <laughs>
Volsic? And that means little wolf in like, oh, Czech. Oh, cool. Or something. I like I that. Was like, Man. I'm sorry, did you say Kek? I did not say Kek. Okay, just show No, me. no, Kekistan here. All right. That's where all the. Uh, I don't even. I still don't really fucking understand that shit. Is is Kekistan. Is, is, is to, to, I'm good. To, to, uh, to people on the right, is Kekistan a good thing or a bad thing? <laughs> it's, it's a good thing. It's a bit. Mm-hmm. It's, it's a, a classic meme. It's a meme. Yeah, the idea is that. All the 4chan guys will get together and live in one place. So it's where they want it. It's their it's their Xanadu or whatever. Well, it's it's just a riff on like, oh, everybody feels sorry for these people from places named Stan that are oh. being blown up and destroyed, and maybe we should create our own country Stan. so people will feel sorry for us. We're refugees too. Lulz, I, get it? I get it. That's very good. Yeah, no, it's a super funny joke. It's definitely worth repeating constantly. I love how the whole point really is that you need to be a victim or like oppressed person in this society, like to be taken seriously. Like that's what they, that's kind of the message that they they have. Yeah. Yeah, And that, 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 you know, white people are oppressed and it's, you know, like, I guess the, the basement dwellers are kind of, you know, looked down upon by society and not treated well and, you know, but you know. Do I look like Matt Christman? Yes. <laughs> yes. I think I do. Um, your you well look. Edged. Well, I do. So you have, I you do have, have more have hair. Beard. We have you're, you're, you're very have similar hair. glasses. You have more hair. You don't wear socks with sandals. I don't. <laughs> Whatever he was. Wearing. I don't wear I don't sandals. Period. I'm sorry. I was that was mean. Sorry, Matt. I love you. You're like my drunk dad who talks in a tin can. Okay. <laughs> Not anymore, baby. <laughs> He's in studio. <laughs> We shall Skype in for a local show. I was looking at a photo of Matt Christman the other day, and I'm like, I, I do look like this dude. I don't look like anybody. You it's look, a real bummer. I try to look like other people. You yeah. look like somebody, but I can't place it. Well, I get that a lot, actually. Yeah, I'm going to think of it. Yeah, I, I guess a couple of people have said uh, Cisco from the Flash TV show, but I don't, oh, really? Really, I don't really see it. I mean, I've seen hair, episodes. What? I've never seen any. I have not. I have. I haven't seen any of the uh, the CW DC shows. They're uh, real dumb. Yeah, CW man. That's actually a trend with pretty much every superhero show, though, which is like the first season is real solid, and then it gets real really dumb. Stupid. Yeah. Yeah, I started watching just watching, you know, when it came out, Gotham. But I just it's twenty four twenty four episodes is way too fucking long. Yeah. I just uh, skip the first season. Yeah. Is it good past the first season? No, but it's fun. <laughs> and yeah, it was you, yeah, and they make Penguin like real gay, which is also yeah. nice. Yeah, Oswald, man. He's he's actually I like the guy good. who played him, he's, the Penguin. Yeah. He's a good actor. He's terrific. Sankovich, Jesus Christ. And and, <laughs> and, and, canon, and canon gay, which is cool. Yeah, he, don't him and Red Red well, have a thing? I mean, he might be Edward bi, Nigma. He, yeah, they definitely have a thing. That's great. It's so great. Aww. Yeah. I do always enjoy I did enjoy the run of I think this was like 2000s era where they had several uh, several Batman issues where both Riddler and Penguin were pun not intended trying to go straight. And like trying like the but the, the the joke of like the penguin trying to run like trying to run a proper restaurant. And like at one point, the Riddler trying to be, you know, it's occasionally like trying to be detective. And what happens when the penguin tries to run a restaurant? But... <laughs> so, yeah, there was a good episode. Those were good issues. Um, all right. We are and today's episode is brought to you by Stamps.com. <laughs> Do you enjoy monthly charges for a service you don't actually use that they slip in and then ding you for for months and months and months until you notice it on your credit card just totally fucking you over and then it's a huge pain in the ass to cancel? Well, Stamps.com has the deal for you. Hey, what the fuckers? Pitney Bows. Use the promo code Mark Marin to get 10% off your next order. 